Book of Hours are artists here to empower and embolden your response to the constant negative sound bites that attack your news and social media feeds. In order to continue making the video essays and art you've come to enjoy, we need your support. Make a one-time donation or become a patron. Thank you. A few years ago, after the 2016 election, we noticed a predominant message that seemed to be coming from friends, media, and social media. Talk to your friends, check in on them, and make sure they're okay. The message was about mental health and depression. It was seemingly innocent on the surface, but it felt deceptive and menacing. As we know, in this age of social media, the 24-hour news cycle and surveillance puts out an idea, message, or phrase, and it's not just a meme or a public service announcement. Bias and agenda, agenda to control, to control exactly, exactly what people think, and this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. Although it's meant to feel like synchronicity and part of the zeitgeist when the message is tailored and everyone is saying the same thing, you know it's propaganda and is out there for a reason, but the reason is always hidden. What was behind this was a way of training people to watch and police their friends and family while using the language of concern for mental health. It was a way of creating a snitch culture without people realizing they were snitching, but instead manipulating people into thinking they were helping people for their own good. After all, checking in on friends is a great way to create a reason for authorities to get into a person's privacy or into their home. Around that time, Julie talked about a law that allows authorities, like the police, to arrest and hold a person for 72 hours. Ultimately, what we have here with the Nicholas Cruz issue and then the Roseanne um, issue is we have an attack on the mentally ill. We all know someone or a family who's affected by someone suffering from mental illness. We have a sheriff in Broward County, Florida, who has come out publicly um, in front of everybody and in front of mainstream media and says that he would like to federalize the Baker Act. The Baker Act in Florida allows law enforcement or medical professionals to confine a person involuntarily while they get examined and looked at. But you have to have a reason, you have to be able to articulate that they're a threat to themselves or a threat to someone else. What I'm asking our lawmakers to do is go back to places like Tallahassee, places like Washington, D.C., and give police the power. We need to have the power to take that person and bring them before mental health professionals at that particular time, involuntarily, and have them examined. We pointed this out because the propaganda surrounding mental health was everywhere, and it felt like something was hidden behind the message. In the past year, in this age of COVID, we've all heard stories and seen videos of police going into people's homes asking questions or arresting people because there were too many people in a house at one time and they were violating social distancing mandates. These visits were not arbitrary. They were reported by neighbors who didn't think they were snitching so much as they were helping and doing things for the common good. This turns into fear within the community. Although the police had no reason for being there, the reports gave them a reason to stop by and talk, a knock and talk conversation that usually escalated into something else. And that escalation was usually created by the police and the situations we heard about or saw were captured on video and released to the public.
got his number. This has led to collective trauma-based mind control. We saw these videos because we were allowed to see them. We were supposed to see them. They were a message. That message said, your human rights no longer exist. The constitution which protects and guarantees those rights is going away. We will enter your home you will be surveilled, and your autonomy means nothing. But why do the authorities need to get into our homes, and why do they need to remove us? With homeschooling, laptops from the schools in the home have cameras that surveil the family. The cameras are extensions of the state and the wraparound services funded by the state, which will then invade your home. It's this subtle or not so subtle intrusion that suspends your right to property and your right to privacy, which are human rights codified and protected in the US Constitution. Case in point, if a child is failing at his tablet learning exercises or is having trouble reading, then an alert will notify his parole officer, I mean his teacher, who will then notify the prison system, excuse me, I mean the school board, who will then send out a representative to evaluate why the child is failing at his exercises. The evaluator will assume it's because of family trauma since trauma typically interrupts the learning process. The evaluator will then suggest wraparound services like counseling or intense evaluation and set up alarms or systems within the house that will alert another wraparound service if the child is not sleeping well, is misbehaving, not eating, or feeling lethargic and uninspired. In other words, a child will not be allowed to be a child naturally. None of this has the outward signs of seizure of property, but this intense invasion into our human experiences is essentially the invasion into our personal home, our sanctuary, and in essence, it becomes property of the state because of the wraparound services that are the tentacles squeezing the life out of individuals within the home. Let's continue to observe different ways the state may seize property. Sustainable development will act as cover for eminent domain. Is your house green enough? If not, you should be able to afford solar panels, recycling services, and water systems that support sustainable development goals. You can't afford these green services? Then perhaps you should move. After all, it looks like your house is in a non-sustainable area, so based on green policy and the Paris Climate Accord, we will have to demolish it because it lives in an area where certain wildlife are going extinct. But not to worry, you can move yourself, your family, and some of your belongings to concentrated urban planning areas where there are bike lanes and walking access to stores that are set up on impact systems that can track what you buy, when you buy it, and where you go. And we can get you out of this dirty, non-sustainable home and set you up in a geo-fenced neighborhood where everything is at your fingertips and you are watched constantly. This is how green language in sustainable development goals act as cover for our eminent domain, something that the Fifth Amendment in the Constitution is supposed to protect you from. Under the Fifth Amendment, if your home has to be seized under these green guidelines, for example, you are supposed to be provided just compensation for the value of your property, and there is supposed to be due process, but that just compensation is based on the local assessor's value of the property. Oftentimes, assessors value the property at one-third the market value, especially if that home is in a low-income opportunity zone. 
And as we know, in the case of an emergency, whether it's a COVID emergency or a green emergency, your rights and protections are suspended for the good of the planet and yourself, of course. My house is the oldest one on my block, okay? It's almost 100 years old. So it's been around a very, very long time. The front yard is going to be removed to widen this road, okay? Oh, because yeah. traffic is such a bear. I can tell you by sitting out on my front porch, there are certain times of the day that traffic is heavy, but it's never to the point of we need to start removing people's yards. And when I say my yard, I mean not just mine, but I have several neighbors. We are private uh, homeowners. Mm -hmm. Our homes are all we have. Sure. Our homes don't bring us income, but they afford us a place to shelter so that we can earn an income. Mm -hmm. And we're talking houses, like I said, 1922, 1928, mid-50s. We're talking 1930s. So we've got a nice mix of all kinds of individual homes that now will have to sacrifice parts of their property for this road widening. So you also look at the master plan. My individual house is not going to matter because it doesn't look like everyone else's house. So we have gentrification now coming in. Mm -hmm. We also see that this will devalue the property enough that I might not can sell it. And if I can't sell it, how am I going to go live somewhere else? The houses they're replacing with, which will come in phase two, by the time phase two comes in, it will be a four lane highway, so my house will cease to exist. Gun control language in the Rescue Act acts as cover for mental health issues that may or may not even exist in a person. Gun control language and seizure of property, such as your home or even your right to move freely, often go hand in hand. While we're still waiting for more information regarding the shooter, his motive, the weapons he used, the guns, the magazines, the weapons, the modifications that apparently have taken place to those weapons that are involved here, I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future and to urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to act. We can ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines in this country once again. We should do it again. These hyper real events and incidents that propagandize violence and promote fear in the populace are not about mental illness, the mentally ill, guns, banning guns, or removing them. These events and incidents are focused on codifying the means to identify, remove, and disappear the most vulnerable in society. If they can do that to them, they can do that to you. The gun control language in the Rescue Act acts as cover for creating mental health issues in people otherwise perfectly sane, and then those fabricated issues are then used as fodder to get the toe in the door of a person's home. As we mentioned before, your kid's tablet learning education is a way for the state to invade every aspect of your life. Gun control language masquerading as the targeting of individuals is the same. What if a person values the Second Amendment of the Constitution? Will they be considered a dangerous person with an unstable obsession with guns? After all, in the state of Pennsylvania, you have to register your bullets, even if you don't own a gun to put the bullets in. The triggering, pardon the pun, gun violence that we've witnessed over the years has conditioned us to think it's perfectly fine to disappear and imprison an individual after the accusation that an obsession with guns wrapped in mental instability goes viral. Nicholas Cruz is a perfect example of that. 
a hardworking young man with a learning disability who worked at a local family dollar and whose own manager said was a good worker who was never late and who had a safe home bequeathed to him by his adoptive parents and who was set to inherit about a quarter of a million dollars from his adoptive parents' estate was suddenly, without warning, called to visit a local high school in Broward County, Florida and within moments was shackled, and his adoptive parents' family removed his inheritance in a quick court proceeding that no one talked about, and the media portrayed him as a domestic terrorist. Never underestimate how the language around gun control and gun violence attributed to mental health can whisk away all of your protections, especially when someone else has something to gain. Nicholas Cruz has yet to receive a trial. As of March 2021, it has been postponed twice and will likely be again. The narrative in the media surrounding him and his trial assume he is guilty. This goes against the American justice system, which assumes you are innocent until proven guilty. But that's not how it works. Our takeaway from the narrative around Nicholas Cruz is that you are guilty without trial and your guilt is determined at the time of arrest. This high profile, extremely triggering case is being used to get us to make an exception for someone like Cruz and accept that this evil person does not deserve justice or a trial. This lack of justice and the removal of constitutional rights tells us that we can expect the same treatment for ourselves in the future. Instead, you will be tried by public opinion, which will be informed through biased media accounts of you, who you are, and what you did, whether you committed a crime or not. Owning a mortgage is a false sense of security. Property titles are held by the banks and various lending institutions. And to be honest, owning a mortgage is basically a fancy way of saying you're nothing more than a renter. Renters have no rights and can be removed from their homes with no warning. And the same goes for mortgage holders. Didn't the housing crisis in 2008 teach us anything? Even if an individual has paid off their mortgage, the bank still holds a copy of the property title to your own home and can leverage the sale of that title to a third party. It's happening in Australia right now. It seems as if the mortgages are the loophole used to undermine home ownership, not secure it, as we are led to believe. Imagine all the people who are living in their homes on mortgages right now, enjoying low mortgage interest rates, What will happen to those people in the future as the banking industry turns its practices over to digitization, exploitation, and sells its reserves, your property title, for pennies on the dollar? The unlawful mandates that brutalized small businesses all across the United States to close their means of production in the interest of the common good was the first act of tyranny after the national emergency was declared on March 13th, 2020. As long as that national emergency still stands, what makes you think they won't use these unlawful, unconstitutional practices to force you out of your personal property or your home? The closure of small businesses should have never happened. It was nothing more than a test of compliance to see how far the state could push you to undermine your own right to provide a stable source of income for yourself and your family. Those who willingly shuttered their businesses and destroyed the fabric of our American infrastructure failed the test in such a colossal way that it looks as if we will not recover. Let you in, you walked into our house. We have that on recording. I am recording it. Don't tell me to get out of my house. This failed test has now opened the door for the state to use every arsenal in its back pocket to undermine home ownership and personal property. 
the blame lies squarely on small businesses who allowed this unlawful act to tear at the fabric of our fragile economy and opened the door to tear at the fabric of the fragile rights of homeowners. And for those businesses who took funding or loans and operate their coffee houses and restaurants under the tyranny of fascism, forcing customers to muzzle or stand in circles like obedient dogs, this is further blatant alliances with exploitive practices and forces that will undermine a person's right to privacy and property. The constitutional attorney John Whitehead writes, The spirit of the Constitution, drafted by men who chafed against the heavy-handed tyranny of an imperial ruler, would suggest that one's home is a fortress, safe from almost every kind of intrusion. Unfortunately, a collective assault by the government's cabal of legislators, litigators, judges, and the militarized police has all but succeeded in reducing that fortress and the Fourth Amendment alongside it to a crumbling pile of rubble. Your right to privacy is codified in the Fourth Amendment. If you allow these deep intrusions through data mining, health mining, surveillance, pay for performance contracts, social bonds, and the impact investments which bank on you to fail, then what you have essentially done is allowed the undermining of the Fifth Amendment to fail you as well. When there is a crack in one, then it undermines the foundation of it all, and your life is nothing more than exploitation for profit at the expense of your basic pursuits of life, liberty, and happiness. And these pursuits can only be achieved if you have a home to call your own.
no, I'll stop that. 